Um, I, one which I'd like to talk about, you, you mentioned in the article, I can't remember exactly the context actually, but you mentioned, because I see this all the time, uh, even among objectivists talking about this, and this is the idea that there's some conspiracy of cultural Marxists yeah. who, are, who, are, who, are, who are on the left, who are taking over, and, the, and they're these, the really, and of course Jordan Peterson feeds this, and a lot of the critics, the good critics, you know, some of them are good, of the, of the nihilistic left, are, are using this term cultural Marxism as if it's a thing, as if it's a as if it's some group out there that's actually doing it. And of course, it's linked to the Frankfurt School and everything, which is real. The Frankfurt School is actually yeah, a real school of, of ideas, uh, really bad ones. But so, so talk a little bit about how you see cultural Marxism in the context of conspiracy theories. I mean, so I haven't studied this as much as I'd like to. I, I, I want to look more into it. I, you know, I read the Frankfurt School Marxists way back in grad school, and I haven't done it since then. They're definitely a... a, a a version of Marxism. There are more new left versions. Yeah. So yeah, people are familiar with uh, Herbert Marcuse. There was an article about him in an old issue of The Objectivist, and he was one of their members. And and it's it's significant that there's a change between the old left and the new left, and the new left starts to uh, is is no longer looking to uh, uh, focus on how can we nationalize industry and have technology in progress. They're instead they're cultural in the sense that they're they're looking to the existing forms of culture that they think are oppressive, like the media and entertainment, and and so there's a bridge between that and the various forms of postmodernism. But and again, I should stop talking because I it's it's not something I've looked at closely enough. I do think that that school of philosophy has had a lot of cultural influence, but the idea that the the real players behind the scenes are any kind of Marxist yeah. these days is the part that I take the biggest exception to. I mean, you, you could loosely call them Marxists uh, in that they're on the left in some sense, but really to call the, the politicians and the activists uh, Marxist is to give them too much credit because Absolutely. Yeah. Marx, Marxism is a sophisticated intellectual construct, yeah. uh, and and this is something that Rand would have said. She would have she would have said that uh, uh, it you know gives you a, a conceptual understanding of the world as a whole. And the, you know the, the Marxists they try to have uh, you know they're they're looking for international proletarian revolution where pe workers from all they over the world utopia. they want people to be happy supposedly right yeah. it's 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 integrated towards a purpose it has an actual purpose whereas today well, yeah I mean, i think what we have today the the activists on the left who are who are pushing for the policies that people are criticizing rightly they're not following any kind of ideological program i think that the obsession with various forms of identity politics, which may well have been encouraged by the new left Marxism of the 60s, uh, they're not working with any ideological agenda that tries to find common bonds of humanity among people. Uh, they're fracturing into, into these pressure groups based, based on ethnicity and, and sex and, and you know, name whichever uh, intersectional category you want. Uh, there's no worldview there. There's no ideological. It's a default on ideology. It's a complete uh, disintegration of knowledge and of 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 ideology. There's not. There's nothing. There's nothing integrating. There's nothing uniting. It's all differentiating. And I should I should mention a plug here for we're doing this conference, this student conference yeah. in November in Atlanta on tribalism, uh, and what Ayn Rand had to say about it. And there's a lot that she had to say about it, but the idea that people are fragmenting into these groups on the basis of very superficial characteristics, uh, perceptual level uh, characteristics that, that pack them into groups, uh, she sees as an inevitable, inevitable outcome of collectivism where people no longer have confidence in, their own, in the power of their own mind, power, their power to make choices as individuals. They're going to bond with people. Uh, they're going to get together into groups for safety, especially in a mixed economy where they're pitted against each other into different economic pressure groups. Uh, and when reason loses its efficacy in their minds, they'll bond on the basis of the, the most superficial traits like race and sex and ethnicity and so forth. 
And I should mention uh, something else I want to do some work on in the near future is I think there's a strong connection between tribalism and conspiracism. I think that, uh, and there are even hints about this in Ayn Rand's own work, especially if you take a look at her essay, Selfishness Without a Self, where she's talking about the tribal lone wolf, which is the person (laughs) in effect who, who wants to be in a tribe, but has been kicked out by all the all the major tribes. And so he sees himself alone against the world and he sees it, that the world is a conspiracy against him. I think that that tribal lone wolf mentality, which is a particular kind of anti-conceptual mentality of the, tri- of the tribalist, that's part of the reason why we see a lot of the conspiracism around us today and part of the reason why we see it on both sides of the political, political spectrum. Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting book that uh, Daniel Pipes wrote years and years ago, before 9-11 even, and it was about conspiracy theories in the Muslim world. Yeah, I've heard of it. And of this. course, the Muslim world is ripe with conspiracy theories. Everything has to be explained by some, in a sense, mystical force because, you know, the Jews or something, because they can't, they've, they've abandoned reason. So everything is fake. So everything has to be some external element that's happening. So everything has to be somebody else's fault. Um, I mean, I think, I think a lot of Donald, I mean, a lot of Donald Trump's rhetoric about about the Mexicans and about the Chinese and is is conspiracy like because it's like it it it's this idea that no no your actions didn't do anything wrong somebody is doing it to you somebody is causing America to be less great not any decision Americans made that could be and it's similar to the Middle East mentality of we can't think these through there has to be just a simple explanation that comes from the outside it's all emotionalism. This is possibly a, a, a opportunity for a segue because uh, something else I want to write on someday yep. is how the uh, the, the most uh, complex conspiracy theory of all time is religion. Yes, because yes. God God is the the big powerful being behind the scenes who's manipulating the world, and uh, it, it uses all the same kinds of arguments too. I mean, there's things they don't un- people don't understand about how the way the world works, and so. It must be some consciousness that's manipulating yeah. things to yeah. be that way. Yeah, no, it serves exactly the same purpose. It, it serves to explain the inexplicable to people. It's motivated by fear, fear of the unknown, fear of not understanding, fear of things they don't get. Uh, 